listeners, welcome to the latest episode of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I'm your host, Keeper of the Quake, Jason Johnston Yellen, and I am joined by fellow Keeper of the Quake, Joshua Hatton. <laughs> Boom! Oh, I didn't know if you were going to lead with that. I hoped you were going to lead with that. Two keepers, keeping the quakes, enjoying the quiche. Fantastic. I would say two keepers, one podcast, but it's two keepers, two podcasts. <laughs> yeah, so we, we got... We got multiples. Whatever people do, um, do not do a search for two keepers, one podcast. You may not get the <laughs> the, the exact results you're hoping for. <laughs> so, so here we are in Extra Extra. Each episode, Joshua or I bring a whiskey, often a whiskey-related news item to the attention of the other. We read it in the first half. We riff on it in the second half. And regular listeners will tell you, you can set your watches by the tight 35 in which we will get out of here. Tight. Isn't that true, Joshua? Tight as a tiger. That's that's what I've always said. Tight as a tiger. So we have an article today sent in by our good friend Michael Nolan, which came to him from his good friend Jam, and he always goes by Jam, capital J, capital A, capital M. That's all I'm going to share here. <laughs> but before we get to the article, just want to do a quick bit of housekeeping. Ah, thank you. Which so many of you have sent in as follow-ups to the Distel, uh, Heineken purchase of Distel mm-hmm. piece that we did. Mm-hmm. And and we were kind of making up as we went along. We weren't finding a lot of details anywhere else. We found our own details after the episode went live. Many people sent in further details after the episode went live. I wouldn't say we were making it up as we were We were 100% going, no. making it what up we as were, we went along. What we were doing is we were going by the information that we had and making suppositions uh, based on the information we found in the like tiny, tiny handful of articles that we could find. By which you mean one article. There you go. Right? <laughs> and what's what's been interesting is since we released our episodes, more articles came through. And like you had said, we've gotten, I wouldn't say a countless number of people reaching out. Not countless. But a good number. Countless. But a good number. Very, a very good number. Which is all to say that it has become crystal clear that in Heineken's proposed takeover of Distel, mm-hmm. the Scottish distilleries that, bless us, are most important to us, oh, yes. they are in a separate subsidiary that will remain under the Distel portion of the business. So go. Heineken are not purchasing three Scottish distilleries as part of this deal. My only hope... Well, first off, I'm, I'm glad this Obi-Wan. is... Obi-Wan? <laughs> help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only help. My only hope, seeing as they are going to stay within the Distel portfolio, is that Distel updates their website to include Buna Hab and Tobermory and Lecheg. If you recall, <laughs> it just said Deanston. <laughs> and so, right, and this added more confusion to what is potentially happening here. So, uh, so Distel, if you're... If you're Hearing us, you may want to add these distilleries <laughs> onto your website. To your website. <laughs> we don't often give advice to uh, multinational global corporations, but when we do, <laughs> <laughs> it's about adding things to their website. <laughs> so so with that bit of housekeeping behind us, I want to turn our attention to something that that I think, a bit like our Pete episode, mm. it's, it's, it's not exactly timely in the sense of it's breaking news within the whiskey industry Mm -hmm. but it's definitely a component that we discuss with a lot of people yes uh, as we're having industry conversations so the headline on today's article which comes from the wall street journal the headline is whiskey boom stresses remote scottish island Mm -hmm. and then the subhead Isla's famous scotch is expanding fast, but residents say the growth is unsustainable. (laughs) And the author of our piece is Trevor Moss. The article comes from September 17 of 2022. And you did say Wall Street Journal, right? I did indeed. I did uh, indeed. Okay, good. I did indeed. So, inhabitants of this remote Scottish island say its celebrated whiskey industry is getting too big as new distilleries open and existing ones expand, Mm. placing its communities under strain. 
While many locals cherish Isla's historic distilleries and value the jobs they provide, some warn that expansion risks turning the picturesque island into a corporate whiskey factory where younger residents can't afford to buy houses and local businesses can't hire staff. Mm-hmm. Quote, They're carrying on a tradition that is well-loved in Scotland of creating great whiskey. Resident Jim McCalman, whose family has been on Isla since the 17th century, said of the distillers, quote continues, but they're making decisions based on the bottom line, not based on what the community needs. Hmm. Not to riff in the first half. Oh, but you're going to do it anyway. I really like the fact that this is coming from the Wall Street Journal, and I'm kind of curious as to where the rest of this article will go, given that for the Wall Street Journal, corporations normally come first and people come second. Oh, see, I I don't have that familiarity with the publication to, to say that. So, yeah, let's, if we can, talk about that in the second half. Continuing with the article. Advocates say the expanding whiskey industry offers the island a future. Quote, We have to play to the strengths we have, said Donald Mackenzie, an Isla native who is building a new distillery here. Quote, Isla's skill is knowing how to make the best single malt in the world. End quote. Isla, pronounced Isla, has been one of <laughs> Scotland's whiskey harlands. Since at least the 1700s, the power of reading it in, <laughs> the power of reading it out loud and yeah. not reading it into one. Islay pronounced Isla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, has been one of Scotland's whiskey heartlands since at least the 1700s. Once a cottage industry, making scotch here is now big business. Uh, and then it goes on to say global giants, you know, Beam Centauri, Diageo, LVMH, Remy Quantro. Uh, all operate distilleries on this wild and rugged island off Scotland's Atlantic coast. The island only made a fraction of the 1.3 billion bottles of scotch produced last year, according to our friends at the SWA Scotch Whiskey Association. And that was me uh, editorialising on the fly to say our friends Mm, at the SWA. But Isla's single malts, known for their smoky peated flavour, are highly prized. In July, a ra- <laughs> in July, a cask of rare 1975 whiskey from our bag, LVMH's Isla Distillery, fetched £16 million at auction, smashing previous records. You can hear Joshua and I wax lyrical about that announcement in an earlier Extra Extra episode. Until recently, Isla was home to eight distilleries, including iconic names like Lefroy, owned by Beam Centauri, and Lagavulin, owned by Diageo. A ninth, Ardnahoe, started production in 2018, sparking a growth phase that is unprecedented in the island's modern history. Three more distilleries are now being built, including Mr. Mackenzie's new Lagan Bay, hmm. with a fourth awaiting approval from the local council. Hmm. Among them is Port Ellen, a fabled distillery that closed four decades ago and is being revived by Diageo. Nearby, LVMH recently doubled production capacity at Ardbeg. Mm -hmm. The boom on Isla is representative of broader growth in Scotch amid a trend toward higher-end spirits. Of Scotland's 139 working distilleries, 11 opened in the past five years. The Scotch Whiskey Association says, with 20 more being built. Scotch exports hit a record £4.9 billion in 2019, according to the Scotch Whiskey Association, having roughly doubled over the preceding decade. What I like is these are things we've covered in previous extra extra episodes. It's nice to be reminded of, of these numbers. Right. Exports have since dipped amid the COVID-19 pandemic and a 25% tariff on scotch imposed by the US, wink. The liquor's top export destination, if you remember, Joshua, those were all, only ever called the US tariffs. They, they were never called anything else. Oh, Just yeah. the US tariffs. The US tariffs, yep. Just the US tariffs. Yep. 
During a recent trade spat with the European Union, the US removed the tariff in July. And we celebrated that in an earlier that expansion. we did. Expansion has roared ahead regardless, though, with whiskey making a decidedly long-term enterprise. Ardnaho, Isla's newest working distillery, won't release its first whiskey until around 2024, nearly a decade after its inception, said Scott Lang, its director, thanks to the practice of ageing scotch in oak barrels for several years before bottling. While whisky has become a pillar of the local economy alongside farming and fishing, some locals say its growth is stretching the island's limited resources, chiefly housing. Mm-hmm. Like many of Scotland's windswept isles, Isla has wrestled for years with a declining population. From a 19th century peak of more than 15,000 inhabitants, Isla, roughly 10 times the size of Manhattan by land area, (laughs) is now home to around 3,000 people. While its thriving distilleries mean it has more jobs than many of its island neighbours, Locals say young families often leave the island because they can't afford houses. People from the British mainland can afford to pay more, while tourism, most of it whisky related has swallowed up much of Isla's housing stock for use as vacation rentals. Alarmed by these trends, several locals launched a Change.org petition in 2019 protesting the industry's expansion, which they submitted to the council. It gathered 222 signatures, a sizable figure for the island. Just really quickly, that 222 signatures, that's 7.5% of the Mm. overall population that that had chimed in or at least signed that document. Yeah. Opponents say the whiskey industry's expansion on Isla should be frozen until action is taken on housing, including limiting the number of Airbnb rental properties. Quote, Foreign enterprises are here trading on the Isla name, but they're distorting the social structure of the island, said resident Bronwyn Curry, one of the signatories. Hmm. Opponents say, and then that's, there's no more quoting happening here. Opponents say the whiskey industry's expansion on Isla should be frozen until action is taken on housing, including giving locals priority when houses are up for sale and limiting the number of properties that can be rented on Airbnb. They also want improvements to overstretched ferry services and roads. We can speak to ferries and roads in the second (laughs) half here. Mm -hmm. Argyle and Butte Council approved the new distilleries because they provide, quote, high quality jobs, end quote, a council spokeswoman said. The council aims to improve housing options for local people by building new properties and and is encouraging distilleries to do likewise, she said. Scotch makers have said they plan to build houses for workers, talked up the economic benefits of their distilleries and donated money to local causes. Mm -hmm. Ardbeg in July, for instance, donated £1 million from its £16 million cask sale. Whiskey expansion could help keep young people on the island by offering them a career path at a local distillery, said Ewan Andrew, Diageo's president of global supply and procurement. Housing is a problem, he said, pledging to consult with local communities to help find solutions. And we're just in the closing portions of this article now. Mr. McKenzie said his company, Isla Boys Limited, Hmm. which makes blended whiskies and owns Isla's Brewery, Ah. aimed to build six to eight houses to accommodate workers as part of its new distillery project, which received planning permission in July. We, quote, we have to have enough houses for locals. The only way is to build them, he said. Thomas Moradpour, chief executive of the Glamorgy Company, the LVMH unit that owns Ardbeg, said housing was also a problem for his distillery. Quote, we're constrained both for visitors and staff, he said. Some islanders argue that more whiskey revenues should stay on the island. Quote, only a small part of the whiskey money trickles back to the island, said Mr. McCalman, 
who runs a local taxi firm. The money isn't serving the place where the wealth is created. Mm -hmm. End quote. Over 90% of scotch is sold outside the UK and most of the distilleries are owned by global companies based elsewhere. Whiskey sold in the UK is heavily taxed at 70% of the retail price. But that money goes first to the British government in London before filtering down to officials in Scotland and then local councils. Quote, If Isla was an independent state, its GDP per head would be enormous. It would be like Monaco, said Blair Bowman, a whiskey consultant. And here endeth the article. So let's take a quick break, and Josh and I'll be back in the second half for a wee riff about. Like the second half of Extra Extra, we have put on wax Joshua, courtesy mm -hmm. of the Wall Street Journal and journalist Trevor Moss, an issue that isn't just affecting Isla. It's affecting many small rural communities sure. around Scotland as the growth of the whiskey industry continues. And both mm. new builds and uh, increases in production, expansions are, are being seen with greater regularity. We're seeing locals priced out of their home markets. And I'm, as I said in the first half, I'm so pleased to see the Wall Street Journal give inches of their paper and inches of their digital paper over to address this issue. So, yes. with that said, you were recently in Scotland, mm -hmm. separately from you and oh, me being true. in Scotland. That's very true. And you were on Isla, mm -hmm. and you were up on Sky, you were up on Rassi. Yes, I was. Were you having any of these conversations with, with people? Was, was any part of this part of a, a distillery presentation or, or general discussion? Well, there there was some talk. I'll, I'll talk separately on the on the Isla piece um, because I, I, I feel as if I can recall a conversation we had with a, with a friend um, not, not too long ago. But when we were on Rase, which is, I think, population 161 people, fewer people on Rase than signed that uh that change.org mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. uh petition sorry by the way um and it was definitely an issue of of bringing people onto the island you know you've got this distillery that is making itself known and is going to start to bring more and more people there and is likely going to expand but as you drive on this island which has only single track roads around it and and you know one of the roads was actually hand dug out by a single person three and a half miles worth it that Oof. yeah that's a true story it's a difficult position for these islanders to be on or distilleries like rase to bring people in as they expand they're going to need more people the more people you have the more housing they're going to need to put these people up and there's nothing there the terrain is difficult the roads are not great i think there's maybe one and a half towns in there on the island and then just randomly mm. dotted around is there a visitor center at rassi a dedicated yeah, visitor yeah, center yeah, gorgeous one at that there is okay so but unlike isla Raze has never had a booming population, right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it mm -hmm. was it was actually it played part in a in a penal colony uh, during World Wars One and Two, right? Having uh, German and you know sold captives there, and so it really wasn't much of a residential island. Where on Isla, like the article had said, like Treffer had mentioned, there was fifteen thousand people at one point, and now it's down to three thousand people. 
But back to your question about discussions that happened on either Isla or Rase. We discussed Rase. When it comes to the Isla bit of it, I remember you and I had a conversation, not just with our friend Ali Chilton, but with um, Sukinder Singh regarding their distillery, Port Natruan. Mm-hmm. And the only way that they were able to get the planning over the line and improved is something they wanted to do anyway, which was to build housing for the workers, to put infrastructure into place that not only attracts workers, but gives them a place to live and a place to call their own. And and I like that Isla is is doing that. I wonder, however, does this does this article make the assumption that it, it, it just simply is is not enough? I think it is simply not enough. Yeah. Like if if you've gone from in the example of Isla, if you've gone from fifteen thousand down to three thousand people mm-hmm. and right now there's not enough housing on the island just building accommodation for workers. Mm -hmm. That seems like bare minimum starting point to rebuild a community. The the issue for me is is a wider Scottish one, which is we used to have steel. We used to have shipbuilding. We used to have coal. And I would say for the last 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, trying to think which year we're in now, We've we've seen Scotland sliding towards tourism as its number one industry. Mm. And so when tourism is your number one industry, it's wonderful when people visit. It's absolutely fantastic. Scots people love welcoming people from around mm-hmm. the world. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Let's give you a you know a warm Scottish welcome. But they need to rest their head somewhere. Yeah. They need to eat somewhere, <laughs> right? They need more attractions than just the bare minimum. And so while if you're a distillery, you look at housing your workers, and that's both on production side and visitor center mm. side, we also need to think about why else might young people stay on an island? What else could be formed around that and so i love course has got its famous jazz festival which was last weekend yes uh from from where we're recording here so the jazz festival brings people birding and hiking bring people Mm -hmm. but you don't really need to bring birders in somewhere or bring hikers in somewhere right that infrastructure exists out there yeah but they still need to eat which means someone needs to cook for them which means someone needs to serve them they need to put their head somewhere if they're not camping that means someone's making a bed for them someone's Mm -hmm. cleaning a house Mm -hmm. for them or a room for them right i think there are ripples that work out from a center droplet in the water here yeah that we need to get more reasons for young people to reside in the communities that they've traditionally been leaving. Getting back to Isla specifically. So I hear everything you're saying and and I agree this is this is a much larger issue. But getting back to Isla specifically and and what Trevor was saying here and I've heard this number before where you had 15,000 inhabitants and we're down to 3. Where did those 12,000 people go? Why did it not multiply? And where is all the housing that was once there? And and who was that community serving? Did did it be did the population leave when the ferries came online and and they saw the idea of of a better life off land and the, and therefore the population just slowly dripped away or like, do you have any in, insight in, into that exodus from Isla? So not just Isla specifically, but, but for the Highlands, oh, the Highland large, and then the Hebrides. Yeah, there right? you go. Okay. Right. Land became more valuable than people. Sheep yeah. became more valuable yeah. than people. Yeah. Landowners cleared people from their, their lands, their traditional lands. Mm-hmm. And, and in some cases, sent them overseas. 
and and in some cases expected to be reimbursed for the money spent mm-hmm. to send them overseas, which seems like an especially cruel twist. <laughs> but but that was it. That was the movement of people off off lands. Then houses become derelict, right? Then they kind of fall back to the earth. Yeah. Then estates get built or corners of, of accommodation get built. And and so you don't have enough houses standing that you think, oh, that would have housed fifteen thousand people. Mm. You you know, especially when you've got one croft that may have held multiple generations of a family, mm-hmm. right? We're looking at houses now as holding four people, when a house could have held ten yeah. or more. That's right. The family <laughs> dynamic was different. There were farmers. You have, farmers needed the kids to till the land. Like that. That I get. That's a good point. Right. Yeah. So. And and then I think there's always been a draw to the cities, right? The the urban renewal of Scotland was incredibly attractive, as you just said a second ago. If you were if you were tilling out a hard, hard life on the farm, rising at the sun up and going to bed at sundown and barely making enough to eat, mm-hmm. and then you thought, I could work at a factory in a city? Like mm-hmm. that that's why people left. That's yeah. why people yeah. moved. That's true of of all of Scotland's agricultural areas. Um, it was still true in 2000 when my parents said to me, like, get on off to America, you know, mm. go go make your way in the world in America. There's nothing for you in Scotland was their exact words. And while I think Scotland has changed to some degree mm-hmm. from you and I being there in, in the last week, Scotland and the rest of the UK is absolutely hurting right now. It's it's absolutely on the bones of its arse. Uh, and inflation is rampant. The pound is crashing. The fuel prices are through the roof. Yes. Grocery store prices have increased. I, I, I had lunch with my mum last week and she's telling me, you know, she's a, almost, <laughs> she'll appreciate me telling you this. In November, she turns 78, right? <laughs> she's, she's, a, she's a pensioner. She's a Scottish pensioner. She's telling me, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just getting used to not running my electricity. Yeah, I'm just trying to make one week shop last for two weeks now, right? A yeah. 78-year-old woman who's lived in Scotland her entire life gets absolutely no thanks for having done that. So, mm. all of this is to say, <laughs> the whiskey industry is booming. And while we've heard it plenty of times in the past that... Isla folk aren't seeing a lot from the Isla side of that industry. Mm -hmm. Scottish people aren't seeing a lot from the industry writ large. And there, there was something in the article that, that struck me and it talked about the, the tax revenue that came Mm -hmm. in from those bottles. It goes to London first and then, and then Mm -hmm. it goes to Scotland. I don't want to get political, but but not all of it. (laughs) Just a wee tiny bit of it. Right. And and I I don't want to get political here over, you know, stay or leave referendums. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. But my understanding is there's the potential for a referendum coming in 2023 or 2024. It still seems unclear what the Conservative government is going to allow happen with that. Okay. But if Scotland left the left the UK to then join the European Union granted their tax money would would <laughs> go to Brussels first it would go, yeah right would it would it go to Brussels <laughs> like like at, at any right and then they're tied to a, a much um, a much weaker currency the euro is not doing great right now even the dollar is stronger than the euro it, it seems like an impossible situation, again, back to your point, where you said this is a Scottish issue and, and not just an Isla issue, but it mm-hmm. seems to put Scotland in this unwinnable situation of, you know, the Scotch whiskey industry could 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 triple in size, and they're still not going to see the monies they need to improve the infrastructure. Again, back to this idea of Isla. When you get off the ferry and you go on, it's these tiny roads that need a yeah. lot of work that can't yeah. handle all of the vehicles that are on there. 
And that's if you've made it across that the ferry is running that week and <laughs> they haven't got the damaged one and there's only one running or they've had to send one of them off to another island. <laughs> infrastructure, right? We're, yeah. we're back talking yeah. about infrastructure yeah. Yeah. and you need money spent on infrastructure. So I think we, we're hearing a number of different things across the board with Scotland and a bit like the peat example, right? The Scotch industry is just one corner yeah. of the use here. It's one corner of the problem. And, and again, this article, a bit like the Pete article we covered a couple of episodes ago, the industry is coming out to say, look, we, we see what you're seeing and we hear what you're saying. And we think we can build some things here. Actually, it makes me think of... Uh, Dave Broom's new book, A Sense of Place, where okay. he goes through some of these newer distilleries. Rassi is one of the examples. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes to Nick Nian. He's on Isla. And, and in these places, he's talking to people about place. What does it mean to be born here? What does it mean to be raised here? And what does it mean to have that decision to stay or go? Yeah. And while, and while it's excellent that some distilleries are allowing the opportunity for some young people to stay. You can't just be a seasonal tour guide, no. right? We need more substantial jobs for people to stay and we need jobs to be available for spouses who are staying. Mm -hmm. And then we need schools for kids to attend who are being raised. And then we need house prices so that people can actually afford to own a home and not just have it be bought up by somebody looking to open a rural bed and breakfast, right? Which, don't want to name drop too much. We did have lunch while we were in Scotland with a, a managing director from a, a, an independent Scottish distillery. Yeah, That's all I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that person was also talking about this, do we build homes for workers? What does it look like in our community yeah. regarding house prices? What does it mean to have access to the mainland? What does it mean to have tourists coming here seasonally, but then our workforce remain here during the winters, you know, which are a very different proposition. So I'm glad that that, that person was thinking about what all of this means mm. as well. And there's, like any other problem, it was the same was true with the, the Pete episode that we have, Nobody's got a magic wand. Nobody's going to be able to solve this in, in one fell swoop. But there need to be changes to infrastructure. There needs to be changing to spending. There needs to be changes to how revenue is shared. Mm -hmm. I was just um, thinking that. Yep. Right. And so there, there need to be systemic solutions put in place to, to be able to, to build stronger Scotland, stronger rural communities. And for the third time this episode, I'm going to say I'm really pleased that the Wall Street Journal and Trevor Moss took the, the inches to lay this out there and for us to say, hey, look, we're hardly even talking about this £16 million cask from Ardbeg. Instead, we're talking about the young people and the workforce yeah. who made that cask possible. That's a that's a significant shift in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And and I, I applaud uh, Wall Street Journal. And like I said a second ago, I, I applaud Dave Broom as well uh, in his new book for, for covering that as well. So recommendation there for listeners. I know listeners like a, a book recommendation uh, here or there. So check out Sense of Place. Yes, I received my advanced copy from the publisher. Same season. My, my purchased copy arrived yesterday and uh -huh. sadly yeah. arrived damaged. So oh. I'll be reporting that to uh, the big digital shopping place. Talk about supporting your local communities. Jason's a hypocrite. <laughs> and, and I'm sure they've got so much money, they will just send me another version of it and, uh, and let the damaged one fall where it may. So... There you go. All right, Joshy, this feels like a tight 35 to me. Does it feel the same to you? It feels tight. Squeaky. Squeaky. That's how tight it is. Wow. From one keeper to another, and to all of our listeners, let me say, peace. Two pieces. <laughs>